Today's a day, as we've already said on several occasions, that we take time to honor the one human being who unselfishly has lived her life for her children time and time again without asking anything in return. Today, if your life has been blessed by a godly mother, you've had a wonderful gift of God that God has given to you in that gift of a mom. Uh, not everyone has enjoyed this great blessing, but those that have uh, can go to their grave remembering uh, the great blessings and the influence that a mom has had in your life. A mom's influence is always there, whether that mom is there in your presence or not. Abraham Lincoln declared this, No man is poor who has had a godly mother. This is a day that mothers are rewarded for washing all those sheets in the middle of the night, driving kids to school when they miss the bus, and enduring all those football games on a cold, rainy night. I like this thought, the indications that you know that you're a mother. See if you can identify with some of these. You offer to cut up other people's food. You hide in the bathroom to be alone. You hope ketchup is a vegetable because it's the only one your kids will eat. You read that the average five-year-old asks 492 questions a day, and you feel very proud that your child is very above average. You use your own saliva to clean your child's face. You count the sprinkles on each kid's cupcakes to make sure they're all equal. You hire a sitter because you can't remember the last time you went out alone with your husband, but then you spend half the night checking on the kids. And then you say at least once a day, I'm not cut out for this job, but you wouldn't trade it for the world. And uh, so much, I think, is, is so true about that. Mother's Day is many things to many people. Some have many, many children. Others just have one. Some have lost their mothers, while others mourn an estranged relationship with the one they still have. Some have had difficulties with becoming a mother, and this day reminds them of a painful reminder of that fact. Still others are whose children have caused great pain in their life as a mother by the path that they've chosen to go. In the Bible, we're introduced to a woman by the name of Jochebed. Jochebed is probably one of the most godly women uh, that's mentioned in the Word of God. There's a lot of great women in the Bible, but Jochebed specifically, as we'll see today, is a wonderful, wonderful mother uh, that uh, shows some wonderful qualities and characteristics that we can emulate uh, in our lives. Yes, I understand the message is about mothers. It's directed primarily to mothers. But because we'll look at Bible principles today, uh, it's applicable to all of us. And so fathers and sons and daughters and, and siblings, we all can glean some wonderful things today, though we're directing this uh, specifically Jochebed and the greatness of the mother that she was. She had a selfless and sacrificial love. In fact, she turned the course of history uh, because she was the instrumental one that allowed the exodus from Egypt after over 400 years in bondage, the Israelite people were in bondage, and it was because of her uh, dedication to God and her love for God and her service of God that allowed the Israelite people uh, to be delivered from Egyptian bondage. Jochebed was a mother of three very famous children. Uh, her oldest, her youngest child was Moses, the deliverer of Egypt. And uh, older than him was a, another son by the name of Aaron. He was the first high priest uh, of Israel. And then the oldest, probably seven, eight, nine years older than Abraham, uh, was Miriam, uh, who was a poet and a singer and a prophetess uh, in Israel. And so uh, Jochebed rose, uh, raised up three wonderful godly children. And that doesn't just happen because we wish it to happen or we uh, dream about it. It's something that's going to require a lot of dedication, commitment on our part uh, as a mom to make sure that we're uh, doing what God desires for us to do. Jochebed, her name means honor or glory to God. And she certainly honored God with her life and with her faith. And that's why I've entitled the message this morning, Great Lessons from a Godly Mother. Great Lessons from 
a godly mother. I'm sure that all of us, I know I could, but I imagine all of us could go back and, and if we took a few moments and wrote down all the great truths and all the great lessons and all that, the great things that our mom has taught us and, and how many of those, uh, those truths still are so much an integral part of our life, we could list dozens and dozens and dozens of different things uh, in, our, in our lives as a result of the influence of that mother in our lives. And so today as we look at some of these great influences uh, of a mother in our lives and some of the examples that Jochebed had in rearing Moses specifically for the task that God called him uh, to accomplish in his life, I want us to look at some of the traits that allowed Jochebed, her name was Jochebed, uh, to be able to trust God the way she trusted God. Uh, you see, there's so many things as a parent uh, that we can only do so much in such a limited amount of time and all the rest, as Sister Priscilla put in her graduation, we do our best, but ultimately it all is up to God. The rest is up to God. And uh, we try to put the right ingredients into our children. We try to put the right uh, example that we lead by example and the role model uh, in their lives. And so Jochebed uh, gave us some lessons today that we can learn about trusting God with our children. And uh, that's sometimes an easier said than done. Uh, God wants us to trust Him. And that God wants them to trust Him with our life. And maybe that's easier than trusting God with our children's life. Uh, because sometimes we want to control and, and make sure everything's okay and, and uh, everything's all right and everybody's happy, everybody's getting along. And, and uh, sometimes it's very difficult to back away and to trust God. And so we're going to learn from Jochebed how she trusted God with her children. And the end result was they were some great men and women and ladies of God that uh, were raised as a result of her influence. First thing I want you to notice is in verses 1 and verse number 2, where the Bible says, And there was a man in the house of Levi that took a, a, a wife, a daughter of Levi. Now, the Levites uh, were a special group of people. Uh, these were the people that were set apart from all others of the tribes of Israel. There were 12 tribes of Israel. And the tribe of Levi was given no inheritance, uh, no uh, geographical location, no property, no land as a part of their inheritance. Their inheritance was God himself. God says, I'll be your inheritance. And, and so their job was to care for the temple. And uh, when they would pack up and leave, they would make sure that got to organize and got all together. And they'd transport to the next location, set up. And so they were in charge of all the, the details that, rever that revolved around the, uh, the, 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 the tabernacle at that time. And then later on, uh, the temple. And so here's a man that took uh, a wife uh, of the tribe of Levi. So both of them were of this Levitical tribe that were set apart and dedicated uh, to serve God solely. And the lady's name, the, the wife that he took, uh, was Jacob. And look at verse number two. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, when the mother saw him, uh, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And so as we look at this uh, lesson today about how to trust God with our children are great lessons from a godly mother. First off, let me just say this. You've got to trust God yourself before you'll ever be able to trust anything you have back to God. I've got to be able to trust God myself. Before you can trust God with your children, it's essential that you have a personal faith in God through Jesus Christ yourself. There's got to be a time in your life uh, when you've trusted Christ as your personal Savior. There has to be a time in your life where you came to that place in your life, that crossroad, where you realize that you're a sinner, undeserving of heaven and deserving of hell, and uh, by God's love and mercy and grace that was made available to us by His sacrificial death on the cross, He paid that sin debt, He suffered that sin cost, and you by faith receive Him, accept Him as your Savior. At that point, you're trusting your life in His hands, trusting Him to be the Savior of your life. Before we can ever trust our children to God, it must be vital that we trust ourselves to God. We see in the first two verses here of Jochebed's personal faith in God, in the first two, ver two verses of this chapter, Jochebed uh, became uh, uh, pregnant with a child, uh, with Moses, during a very difficult, difficult time. The Israelites were slaves at this time in Egypt uh, in bondage. Pharaoh had uh, told the Hebrew wives that 
that any Hebrew boy children that would be born would be killed. And, and so this was a very difficult time for any mother to know that uh, this child, if it's a boy child, uh, automatically Pharaoh uh, is going to have this child uh, killed. Uh, the decree uh, was one of Satan's early efforts to prevent the birth of the Savior or Messiah by attacking the Jewish race. And uh, he did all this from Genesis all the way through. He tried to, to, to circumvent and short circuit the, the genealogy and the lineage through which Christ would be born. And so all of these different steps was to try to uh, prevent our Savior from coming, which would be the ultimate defeat of Satan himself. And so when the midwives refused to let uh, them live, Pharaoh issued additional warnings. So imagine in the context of this story how Jochebed must have felt when she learned that she was expecting. She, I imagine those first few months, she didn't know if within her uh, was a little boy or a little girl. And uh, she knew if it was a girl, uh, she would live. If it was a boy, then as soon as he was born, he would die. And there were, there were no ultrasounds, obviously, in those days. And so she would continue to wonder and pray and seek God's face and trust God and say, God, I don't know what's going to happen, but God, I'm trusting you that you work out all the details of this delivery. The day arose, or the delivery came, and, and the day arrived, and uh, she gave birth to a son by the name of Moses. Jacobed was a wonderful example of personal faith in God. In fact, her and her husband were such godly heroes of the faith that she's mentioned, they're both mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. The Bible says, by faith Moses, when he was born, was he had three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. And so nothing has such a profound impact on the life of a child than a mom and a dad that de desire to live for God, that desire to serve God, that desire to walk with God. There's no greater impact you can have on your children than to do what you're doing today by recognizing the importance of being in church together as a family with your children, walking together with God and saying, God, we've got to have your involvement. We've got to have your help. We need your involvement in rearing our children for you. It's such a difficult job with God, much less without God. And so the Bible tells us in Exodus that she saw that her child, Moses, was a goodly child. Hebrew refers to him as a proper child. The word goodly means beautiful or good. Special purpose in his, uh, in his life. I imagine you ladies, and you're, you ladies, you know, as a dad, we'll hold the baby in our hands and uh, the awkwardness of it, and, and uh, it just sort of just it doesn't uh, feel normal and natural to us. But a mother and that first child, uh, for all those years of, of cradling a little uh, toy uh, uh, baby doll and then pushing the little uh, doll cart and, and uh, playing the uh, mother all those years, it seems so natural as she holds that little baby there and only a mother looks down that child uh, with a vision of a special purpose and a special plan and this person this little baby is going to do something great and God has a special plan for their life a dad looks down I remember when I was born uh, my dad was at the racetrack uh, Golden Gate racetrack and uh, shows how important I was when I showed up and uh, when he did finally saw me he said it looks like a water buffalo and he was probably pretty accurate on, on how I looked as a water buffalo but no mom, no mom saw their baby, sees their baby as a water buffalo boy, they all look the same to us, right fellas and that uh, wrinkly and, and, and scrawny and small uh, but to a mother there's a special beauty, there's a goodliness there, there's a, there's a special envision that she has as she looks at that child with a special life that that child's going to live a special purpose that that child is going to accomplish and God did have a special purpose for Moses as, as we all know as we'll see unfold today but may I also say that God also has a special purpose for your child and that God has given you the opportunity God has entrusted to you the privilege to rear that child and to be the influence and the role model and the example and to instill that little child so that child one day can do something great for that purpose and that plan that God has given him life or given her life and what a privilege that is 
as a mom, has so much time that she's able to spend with that child. And we see in Psalm 139 that the Bible says, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made marvelous. Are thy works, and thy soul knoweth right well. And it talks about, uh, before I was even formed, God said, I knew you. I knew your purpose. I knew your plan. And may I say that you as an adult today, God also has a purpose and a plan for your life. You may feel that, man, I've messed up. I've gone down the wrong path. I've disappointed my mom. I've grieved the heart of my parents. But may I say, there's a purpose. There's a plan. And it's no coincidence today that we've gathered together on this Sunday morning, on this Mother's Day, to remind you that that purpose is still alive in your life. You're still alive today. So God still has hope that you'll accomplish that purpose for your life as well as mine. And so these days are ordained by God for your children written in God's book before they ever, ever came to be. And, and Jochebed had faith to see this. She looked at that little child and she had faith to believe he's going to do something wonderful. There's something special about this child. They're going to do something amazing. There was something that only a mother, the faith of the mother could see. And so we see that by faith, Jochebed hid Moses for three months because he saw that he was not an ordinary child. He was a good child, had a special gift from God. Because why did she hide him for three months? Because remember, Pharaoh came out with that order. Any male child that's born is going to be killed because the king was threatened by any male. The children of Israel were populating and growing and were beginning to overpopulate the land. He said, I don't want those male children to be around. And he said, I want you to get rid of them. And so uh, we see through Scripture that not just Moses' mother, Jochebed, but many of the other ladies, Hebrew wives, uh, they also hid their babies, uh, their boy babies, uh, because they didn't want them to be killed. And uh, they were sparing them and setting them aside. Uh, you see, uh, we ought to obey God rather than man. There's some times that the government may tell us to do something that God says uh, ought not to be done. And uh, one of those is taking the life of an innocent child. And uh, they said, listen, uh, you know what? There is a choice you have. You have a choice to abstain. You have a choice to give it up for adoption. Or you have a choice in the motherhood. There is a choice you have. And they said, listen, there is no choice to take the life of that little child you know the government demands it here they decide know what we're not obeying what the government says this is a gift from God this is a life that God has given to us and they took that little baby risking their lives and the life of their family for the sake of protecting that little baby you see if we don't protect them they certainly cannot protect themselves and it's our job as parents, it's our job as Bible-believing Christians to recognize the value and the sanctity of life uh, as conception takes place where life begins. And so we recognize that they were not afraid, the Bible says, of the king's commandment. I don't care what the king's commandment says. I don't care if he's going to watch the baby die. This is God's gift to us, and God has given us the privilege to raise this child up for God, and we're going to trust God that God will give us wisdom and direction and guidance in raising this child uh, for God for three months. They hid. You can imagine when the little baby would begin to cry and they maybe would hear the soldiers outside the street and they'd go in the back room and close the curtains and close the doors and, and try to get the little baby not to cry and to keep him calm and, and to just keep him out so that nobody would know uh, what was going on there. But there came a time when they could no longer, the Bible says, hide the children and so now we recognize that when they can no longer hide the child, we now have to come to verses 3, where the Bible says, and the Bible says, and when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags of the river brink. She took it down the Nile River. Here's the story. For three months, Miriam, the older sister, Aaron, the little older brother, and Moses were there. There was a time that they could no longer hide little Moses. And so now she first had to trust God with herself. But secondly, she had to trust her children to the Lord. You see, mom and dad, there comes a time in all of our lives to where we can only do what we can do. And we have to trust God with our children. 
It's a very difficult step to take. It's a very difficult letting go process to take place. But here she was three months she had that little child. And three months she, she nourished that little child. And three months she got to caress that little child. And three months she got to cradle that little child. And for three months the urgency of the moment it was gone. And now she made a little ark of bulrush and went down and got some, uh, some of the, 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 the two leaves and some of the, the reed grass and began to form a little ark. And they began to put some of the mud and pitch and round it to try to keep the water out. Not knowing the destiny at all of what would happen uh, to little Moses as she took him down to the river. And when she couldn't hide him any longer, she exercised faith by giving her child to the Lord. She took that little child and put him in a little basket and a little bulrush basket and, and covered it up, I'm imagining, maybe with a little cloth and, and set it alongside uh, the river there, maybe stuck in some of the, the high grass and, and just left, left the little baby there, uh, not knowing if she would ever see him again, not knowing that he would even make it alive again, not knowing what the outcome would be, but knowing that's what she had to do. She had to trust God with her child, and so she left him there at the Nile River. Can you imagine giving up your three-month-old little baby? Can you imagine after giving birth to your child, after nursing your child, after quieting the fears and cries of your, of, of your child, after rocking and holding your child at night, can you imagine giving up your child not knowing, not knowing at all what would happen to him once you left him at that little river, that big river, now river, and then walked away? But you see, Jochebed had done all that she could. And now she needed to trust God with her child. And you know what? There's going to come a time, as I said a moment ago, when you've done all you can do. You've done all you can do. Physically speaking, you can continue to pray. You can continue to do right and to serve God and live for God and be a godly role model, a godly example. But physically speaking, you've done all that you can do for your child. And she, by faith, she left him there at the Nile River. I'm sure that Jochebed probably thought she'd never see her son again. But she entrusted her child into God's hands. You see, letting your children go is never easy as a parent. And it doesn't just happen once. It happens over and over again. The first time leaving your child with a babysitter. The first time dropping your child off to preschool. Graduation. Marriage. On and on and over and over again. Constantly letting go. It's been said, mothers begin saying goodbye to their children from the moment that they are born. And so you need to start giving your children to the Lord from the moment they're born because it's an ongoing process. It's a continual process that you must give back to God over and over again. I think of Samuel, uh, the prophet's mother, Hannah, who made a vow and she says, If thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto me a, a man child, I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And uh, she said, Listen, I promise God, if you bless me with a child, I'll give him back to you. And uh, if you bless me with a young person I can raise up for you, I'll raise him up for you, God. I'll be the right example, the right role model, and I'll let him go. I'll put him in the bull rush and realize I'll do all that I can do, but there comes a time I've got to let go and trust God to do what only God can do in caring for that child. Once you've given your child to the Lord, you've got to trust the sovereign care of God. You see, God gave you a child. They never were yours. They always were his. They were entrusted to us by God to be reared as a steward of God to raise those children for the Lord. Uh, they do have a free will. Our children can choose to do whatever they want to do with their life. It uh, doesn't mean you're a bad parent because a child chooses to go a different direction, different than the way that you raise them. Uh, but our job as a parent is to make sure we instill within them the, the, the tools and the information, the ingredients that are necessary for them to go the right path. But ultimately, they've got to make that choice to go down that right path and there we see that God's sovereignty was at work. I want you to notice the sovereignty of God uh, here. God worked, first of all, through the midwives who spared the Hebrew babies. There was a group of mothers who says, you know what, I don't care what the government says. I don't care what Pharaoh says. I'm not killing my baby. And uh, God gave me this gift. And uh, God gave me this child. This child has life, and I'm not going to give up uh, the life of this child. Uh, I'm going to fight for the life of this child. Then we see God working through Jochebed. Uh, where he hid, she hid Moses for three months. God worked through Miriam who watched over Moses' basket. 
And now God works through Pharaoh's own daughter because look what happens in this wonderful story. And the Bible says, let's read on, and look at verse number uh, 4. And his sister, that's Miriam, probably seven, eight, nine years older than Moses. And so we're looking at just a young, elementary age young girl. She stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. What's going to happen to my little brother? And the daughter of Pharaoh came down. Watch the sovereignty of God at work. God's working behind the scenes when we don't see it. She came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children, Hebrew's children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I'll give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. Look how God works. Jochebed gives her baby to the Lord. But you never give back to God what God doesn't give back to you in so much greater and grander of a way. See, I mean, look at what God did. I mean, here she, she, from her perspective, walking by faith, she never knew if she would ever see her little son again. She maybe thought, the only three months I had was it, and I'll never see him again. But she gave him up by faith, trusting God. Oh, but look how God worked. Miriam was in the distance watching to see if the little brother maybe got in the current, maybe drifted down a little bit and got stuck in some more of the, the reed grass or some of the... Uh, the, the, the high grass along the edge there, and she watched from a distance, unseen by anybody else, but she watched, watching her, her little brother. And then she saw uh, Pharaoh's daughter, the, the man that made the decree, every boy child's got to be killed. The daughter, uh, that man, uh, sent them, her maids and servants and uh, to go get that, what is that bull rush over? What is that little basket there? And when they looked at the basket, opened it up, a little baby inside began to cry. She said, this is one of the Hebrew babies. This is one of the Hebrew boys. Miriam comes down and says, ma'am, would you like me to find someone that can maybe care for that little child and nurse that little child and, and uh, help that little child? And, and Pharaoh's daughter on the sovereignty of God says, that's, I didn't think, that's a wonderful idea. That's something I need done. Yes, find someone for me. Well, Miriam happened to know someone who she could go find that was able to nurse that little child. It was Jochebed. And Jochebed was able for those next three to five years to raise that child. And not only did she get to raise her child, but Pharaoh's daughter paid her to raise that child. Boy, I mean, God is just working behind the scenes. All those three to five years, four to five years, uh, were amazing years. But you know, ladies, how quickly that time would go. Three months went like this. Wow, three months is gone and I got to give him up. And a few years later, she once again would hear the voice of Pharaoh's daughter that was once again time for her to give back Moses. Let me give you this last point and I'm done. I said, trust the Lord yourself. Trust your children to the Lord. And let me say this, raise your children in the Lord. She just had a few years to teach her kid, to teach Moses about God. She had just a few years to teach him about God's people, about God's plan. She had just a few years to teach Moses about the creator God of the universe, about Noah and the flood, about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. She had just a few years, a short time to teach about God's promise to Abraham and that God would deliver his people out of Egyptian bondage. Remember, he was born while they had been in slavery now for almost 400 years and they had cried out for God for a deliverer. And now he would be that deliverer, just a child, just a little boy right now. But in a few years from now, he'd be the one that God would raise up, was raising up to be the deliverer of Egypt or the Israelites out of Egypt. But above all, I believe, that Jacob had taught Moses about a young man by the name of Joseph. A young man who lived for God in an evil time. In the same royal courts that Moses would soon be taken to. She told him about how Joseph had been sold into slavery into Egypt. 
But she told him how Joseph, in spite of his very impressionable youthful age, he took a stand against impurity, and he took a stand against immorality, he took a stand for right. He was a young boy, Moses. He lived for God. He served God. He was in a wicked culture, raised in a wicked environment, but he lived for God. He talked about how Joseph suffered for his godliness, how God raised him up to the last to be the right hand of Pharaoh. And Jacob, the emphasis here is almost uh, sure because Moses devoted one fourth of the book of Genesis to the story of Joseph. Why? Because that might have been the story he heard over and over and over again as that young impressionable boy three years old, four years old, five years old. But you can't live right in an unrighteous world. But you can't live godly in an ungodly world. Joseph did it Moses and so can you. In a few years, I'm going to give you up. You're going to go and live in the palace of Pharaoh. You're going to only have you're only going to have a short time to remember what I've taught you. But what you've learned here can keep you on the right path. That's why, moms, it's so important. Those first few years are so formable and so impressionable. Don't waste those years when your kids are there at those three and four and five years old. Listen, that's when they need a mom to influence them. That's when they need a mom to direct them. That's when they need your love and your involvement in their life. She just had a few years, and those few years had such an impact. On Moses' life. Don't tell me that you can't turn out right living in a, in a not right world. Don't tell me you can't turn out godly living in an ungodly environment. You can if you've got a mom that takes the time and the urgency of the hour to say, I've just got a short time to teach you how to do right. You can live right. You can do right. Joseph did. Joseph did. And so because she knew one day he'd have to stand alone. There comes a day in all of our children's lives where we're not there to make them do right. We're not there to help direct them in doing right. Where we can't be there to instruct them in doing right. We've instilled within them and they've got to stand and say, I'm doing right. I'm not going to be dishonest at work and, and uh, cheat my boss and, and things. Why? Because my mama, she taught me, boy, the importance of living right and doing right and being honest. And, and I, I can't go down the wrong path. And I can't hang out in that wrong crowd. And I can't go down that wrong direction. I can't do that. Why? I don't want to break my mom's heart. I don't want to grieve my mom's heart. I want to do the right thing and do the right thing and do the right thing. And there Moses did right all because of a few years, a few years, that Jacob had had of instilling in the heart of a young, young boy, not even in school yet, three, four, five years old, but yet very impressionable years. Jacob had knew her time was limited with her son. Can you imagine the urgency in teaching him what she needed to teach him before he was gone? She never knew when the voice would be heard, all right, I need Moses now, he needs to come to the palace. She never knew when she would hear that. She never knew when it would be a time where the, the maid of, of Pharaoh's daughter would show up and says, I'm here to, to bring back the, the child and he's through being, he's weaned and able to come back. She never knew that. There was an urgency of giving everything she could, every information, the example she needed to be for Moses. The Bible says, train up a child the way he should go and when he's old, he'll not depart from me. Eventually the order came from the palace, send me Moses. Jacob had kissed Moses goodbye and says probably, son, remember what I taught you. Don't forget. Remember what I taught you. It's going to be a tough world. There's going to be a lot of temptation. There's going to be a lot of pull to pull you away from where you've been taught. Oh, but don't, don't not do it. Do right. Do right, son. I'll be praying for you. I'll be praying for you. You got to do right, son. You got to do right. The people of God are depending upon you. I don't know what your purpose is. I don't know what your plan is. But I know God's got a special purpose. I know God's got a special plan. Just keep doing right, son. Keep doing right. God in his sovereignty would work. And he allowed Jacob to raise Moses herself and teach, her, teach him how to have faith in God. He was going to now be trained the University of Egypt. The temptations of the palace, the lure of position and power and wealth and possibility of worldly throne never erase his mother's training. It's all a part of God's plan because one day Moses would be the one raised up to deliver Israel out of Egypt. Let me say this and I'm done. 
You say, preacher, how do you raise your children in the Lord? How do you raise them in the Lord? How do you do what Jochebed did? Well, your children may be raised right now, but you might be a grandma that can have a great influence, a grandpa that can have a great influence. Wherever you are, there's young ones that need you to lead and guide and direct them. How do you do that? Number one, I think, you got to teach them God's word. you got to teach them God's word. Deuteronomy 11 says, Therefore they shall lay up these words in your heart, in your soul. Bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontless before your eyes. You shall teach them your children, speaking of them, and thou sittest in thy house, when thou walks by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest. Said, Listen, don't underestimate the importance of teaching the stories of God. The story of God's love and of God's promises. The, the stories, teach them about sin and their need for forgiveness. Teach them about Jesus and the cross and salvation and fi- uh, faith in Christ. Teach them the uh, stories of the Bible. Teach them the Bible. Teach them the word of God. Thy word of, you got to hide in their heart. Why? Because someday, mom, you're not going to be able to be around them. Someday, dad, you're not going to be able to be around them. But God in their heart, through what you've instilled in them, through the word of God, it'll be there. And you got to get the word of God in their little hearts. you got to get the word of God. May I say, secondly, got to bring them to church. Got to bring them to church. Hebrews 10 says, Don't forsake the assembly of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much as more as you see the day approaching. Come to church as a family is so important in raising your children for the Lord. I understand sometimes you can't come to church as a family. Maybe some family member has to work, and maybe some family member uh, doesn't have a desire for the things of God. I'll tell you what, the greatest gift you can give your children is have a mom and a dad and have a family, a support group, that together we're going to church and, and we're going to live for God and we're going to learn about God. And so I've got to learn about the Bible. I've got to go to church together. Don't just send your kids to church. Go to church with them. Bring them to church with you. Have it as a family thing. When I was growing up as a young boy, uh, my mom, my dad, they did not go with me to church initially. They sent me to church. I went up a little church. We live in San Cl- Santa Cruz, California at that time. And uh, up a hill was a little Presbyterian church. Happened to be the closest church. Uh, I had a little school and Bible time, a Bible school. And, and uh, mom would walk me up uh, to the this, this church, drop me off. And uh, she'd walk back home because Sunday was football day. And dad watched football back home. And, and uh, he'd have all the, the gambling, the betting, and the, the uh, sports books and all that stuff. He'd have all that lined up for the weekends. And I'd go to church. And then when church was over... I'd have to walk back home by myself. And I'd walk down that road, and, and I'd have my memory verse I'd have to memorize. And, and I did that for about uh, six months to a year and just was sent to church. Just sent to church. Just sent to church. Oh, but there came a day. There came a day when my mom and dad and myself, we trusted Christ as our Savior, and it was no longer us, me being sent to church. It meant us all going to church together as a family. Well, we'd get in the car together and we'd go to church. And uh, we'd sit in church together and we'd sing the songs together and, and uh, we'd worship God together. And what a wonderful life memory and experience and foundation it was for my life in those early years and even later years of my life. You see, coming to church as a family is one of the most important things you can do to raise your children for the Lord. You see, things are better caught than taught. They're going to do what you do and not what you say. You tell them not to smoke and they watch you smoke, they're going to smoke. You tell them not to drink and they watch you drink, they're going to drink. They're going to do what you do, not what you say. That's why it's so important that we live the right kind of example, that we're the right kind of model. Roma, because what my walk talks much louder than my talk talks. And I can say, and we know as, as young people growing up now as adults with their own children, uh, how maybe our parents were inconsistent. They said one thing and they did something else. And uh, what do we yield to? We, we, we deferred to what they did versus what they said. And, and so it's so important that we do that. And lastly, may I say this, and this is probably one of the most important things. Will you, pr- you can pray with them and pray for them. Pray with them and pray for them. When you pray with your children, you're following the example of your Savior because Jesus says when they brought unto him little children, he should put his hands on them and pray. And his disciples rebuked him. And what did he say? Suffer the little children to come unto me. For such is the kingdom of God. You know what you can do, mom, for your kids? You say, I, I can't do much for my kids. Oh, you can. You can pray for them. And when they're little, you need to pray with them. Pray with them. Get down by their little bed. So I'm going to say our prayers tonight. And uh, you kneel down by your, their bed, and, and uh, you put their, your arm around them, and you say, all right, you, know, you start off praying to Jesus, 
and you thank him for your mom and for daddy and thank him for the food that God's given, a nice bed that you have to sleep in. Thank him, I know it's hard. Thank him for your brother, all right, for a sister. And uh, thank him for all the blessings God gives you. And then when they're through praying, then you pray, dear Jesus, thank you for this wonderful blessing. Of, and then you mention their name. And he's such a good boy. He's such a good girl. And God, I know you have a special purpose in their lives. I know you've got a special plan in their lives. You know what you're instilling in their little hearts? God's got something special for me. He sure does. God's got a purpose for He sure does. Do you think mom got, oh, yeah, he does. And you pray with them together. But there comes a time when you're not just able to pray with them. Now all you can do is pray for them. They may be no longer within your sphere of personal influence, uh, within range of your geographical location, but you can pray for them. Pray for them. Dear God, would you please help them? Lord, help them not to be around that wrong crowd. Help them not, not to do the wrong things. Lord, help his conscience, Lord, to bother him. Help him not to go down that wrong path. Lord, please, would you please protect him, God? Would you help him, Lord? Please, would you, would you bring him back, God? We didn't raise him up that way, and we didn't raise her up that way, and God, would you please bring her back? Would you bring her back to you, God? And you're praying, and you're praying, and you're praying. Oh, I'll tell you what, that's a powerful influence that you can have on your kids. You see, you can't parent your child forever. But you can provide a strong foundation before you let go and give them to the world. Raise your children for the Lord. Then you've got to let them go. Then you've got to trust God with their care. You do your best, and we fall short all the time. We can all go back and say, boy, I wish I would have done some things different. Who doesn't? I wish I wouldn't have done that. Yeah. I wish that would have been more of a priority to me. Yeah, we all could. But listen, you did the best you could. You did the best you could. And all you need is God to do the rest. And you know what? God can take all of our weaknesses and imperfections and frailties and, and our doing our best, as weak as it might have been, and God can use all of that, and with his input, he can take that which seems broken and battered and, and, and shattered, and he can use it and rebuild and help that child to be something they never could have been without your love and influence and continued prayers and without God's influence in their lives. Mom, no matter how old your kids are today, they still need you. They still need you. And your love and your involvement in their lives is so important. If not now, more, maybe more now than ever. Don't neglect the influence that you have as a mom. Boy, God's blessed us. We're, we're a blessed people. We're a blessed people. Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you give to us. We're all so undeserving. We're all so undeserving. But Lord, you've all blessed us with a special person in our lives. That special person is who we call mom. Lord, I pray that we would take the influence and the example and the information and truths that, the, that our moms have instilled within our hearts as a young little child or even as an adult child. But we'll continue to allow that influence to draw us closer to you and to serve you in a greater way. Our desire today, God, is to trust you with our, our lives, to trust our children to you, and then, Lord, to realize all we can do is the best we can do, as imperfect as it is, and we leave the rest in your hands. This morning, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I know today has a lot of different emotions for all of us. Oh, but may, may I remind us that the greatest gift that you can give, that I can give to my mom, is to trust God with my life.
trust God with my life. Because your mom raised you up to trust God. Knowing that one day you'd be weaned from her. And you'd need to glean your trust from Him, God. I wonder today you say, Pastor, if I died right now, I don't know for sure I'm going to heaven. I don't know that for sure. But I'd like to know Christ as my Savior. Point number one, I, I need to trust Christ with my life. I need to trust Him. Who would be honest enough to say, Preacher, I don't know that. I don't know that for sure, but, but I'd like to know it today, and I'd like to trust Christ today as my Savior so I can know that heaven is my home. There's no greater expression of love that you can give back to your mom than today to be the day that you trust Christ as your Savior if you don't know Him today as your Savior. Is anyone like that this morning? Say, Preacher, I don't know that, but I'd like to know that this morning. All over this room, just slip it up so that now. I don't know that, but I'd like to know that. Anyone like that? God bless you. All right, anyone else? Just slip it up, slip it down. All right. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the few moments that we've had together. And I pray for this invitation moment, Lord, that you allow all of us to recognize that there's a God in heaven that loves us. And he wants to do some great things in our life. We do have a purpose and a special plan that God wants to accomplish in our lives. But I pray that we would yield ourselves to you, allow you to work in and through us to accomplish your purpose and your plan. Lord, there may be some today that know you're not a Savior. Lord, I pray in these next few moments that they'll respond. This altar be filled with folks saying, if none of the reason, God, just thank you for a wonderful mom that you've given to me. Lord, help my life to be lived, never to bring shame and dishonor to my mom. I want to honor my mom in her life and in her death. I want to honor my mom while she's alive and though she may no longer be with us, I want to honor her with my life. Help that to be our prayer, our desire this morning.